This all hails from watching old episodes where caller after caller would say, question about evolution. And y'all would say, we're not biologists. Why are you calling us? And I was like, I'm a biologist. I can answer the questions. And so uh, this, what I'm going to do is continue my series that I started on New Year's Eve, if you're familiar. And uh, it's eight difficulties with um, evolution. And the difficulties actually means uh, it, it hails from my husband. He comes from people who are very, very religious and, and don't get evolution. And I asked him, so what is it that stands in the way of people understanding evolution? Because to me, as a scientist, it seems pretty easy and obvious. Uh, and so he came up with eight things that stand in the way, and I'm going to address them one at a time. Uh, New Year's Eve, I did one of them, and I'm going to talk about that for just a second. But uh, what I'm going to deal with today to start with is if this is, I'm a teacher at heart, so bear with me. I'm going to use lots of examples. If this is the, the double helix of DNA, it unwinds and it essentially unzips. And the teeth are the nucleotides. Those are the, that's the, the letters that get read and turned into protein. All living things are made of protein and stuff that protein makes, like bone. And uh, we're going to talk about how DNA gets turned into an organism. And then also mutation a little bit. And we're going to cover all that in about 20 minutes. I'm going to get rid of jargon. I'm going to make this as simple as possible. If you want something more complicated, I will have resources at the end of this that you can find more information. So. One of the best ways to teach is a, uh, let me start this up here. I'm hoping this works. Yes. Okay. Can people hear that? I don't think they're going to get the audio. They're not going to get the audio. You can't hear it at all? No. Dang it. All right. So back to me, if we could. Thank you. I love this. All right. So, music. Um, this is a musical score. It is not the thing that is what you hear, but it is the information that you need in order to get to the music. Um, this is a pretty good parallel for uh, how DNA gets turned into protein. You have to have the information. And in this particular thing, you've got some up on the screen behind me. There are notes, there's uh, the bars, the time signature, the instruments that are playing. All of those things go into making the entire piece. If you listen to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, it's important to listen from the beginning to the end. Otherwise, you don't feel like you've experienced it. And uh, if you do things out of order, it doesn't seem like it's Beethoven's that something's not right. But it might be still a nice piece. Um, so that change, the way things should be, um, that's where we're going to start with that. Um, I'll get more into detail with that. All righty. So um, back to the slide. I'm going to go to the next one. All right, so this T-shirt, it is kind of funny, but it's not really. The reason I do all this is because somebody who is near and dear to me, her church taught this, seriously. That's how much they don't understand evolution. That's how much they deny the information that evolution provides. And so uh, That's why I do, I have fought the State Board of Education here in Texas to try to get them to teach evolution properly. And that's why I'm here on this show, because unfortunately, religion messes with science. And it, uh, uh, so I need to deal with it. Um, let me start with this, if we can go back again, one more thing. Okay, how many of you have seen this little book? It was given to me, <laughs> yes, and it's uh, 
this is how far off they are. Let me read the title to you. Life, how did it get here? By evolution or by creation? That doesn't even make sense if you're a scientist. That's like saying, uh, peanut butter, what kind of tree does it grow on? Persimmon or the great oak? I mean, it's just nothing to do with anything. That Nothing really makes sense, right? So uh, just to start with, let's clear up that little problem. Uh, so uh, there is how life began from a planet that was just organic material and not nothing living was there. And then there's how the living organisms, once they came to be, how they became so, uh, how, how they came to have so many brilliant forms. So the, Matt has said this before, but I'm gonna say it here again with some pretty pictures. Abiogenesis is when you go from no life to life. That is an entirely different question from how evolution occurs. And you get this question a lot about how uh, if you, uh, evolution doesn't explain how life began. And so it seems like a stupid question, but to somebody who's religious, it's really not, because uh, when you explain evolution, that's explaining something that God, uh, to them, did. Right. And then the next thing down for them is the creation of life. And so that's God and this has got to be God. And so they don't understand that evolution and abiogenesis to scientists are two entirely separate things. To them, it's just all this God. So what you're dealing with really is them having to let go of their dogma. And that's why that's so hard for them. Um, okay, dokie. Boop. Abiogenesis is not the same as evolution. Okie dokes. Um, Matt. Yes. <laughs> have you had a flu shot in the past? Yes. I have too. Uh, have you ever looked at different kinds of dogs? There's dachshunds and Afghans. Very different organisms, right? Yes. They all have a certain set of genes that are in their population that are different from the other critters in that population. Yet, they are both organisms. Uh, the fact that those two populations are different, that's evolution. The fact that you get a shot every year because the viruses evolve every year, that's evolution. It is simply a change in frequency in genes in a population. That's all it is. It's a fact. It is a fact. Now, where things get hairy is how we explain how evolution occurs. And that's where the theory comes in. I already talked about the theory on New Year's Eve. I'm not going to go into that again. But uh, evolution is a fact. OK, the eight difficulties that my husband came up with. Uh, First was the emotionally icky business. Um, I talked about that on New Year's Eve, and I'm gonna cut back to that for just a second. Incredulity, what about the missing links? Infinity versus finality, the difficulty that people have with understanding the time scale. Lack of evidence, they think there's no evidence, which is ridiculous. I'm gonna enjoy doing that show when we get to it. Parsimony, they think that parsimony means that God is the simplest answer, and really, evolution is the simplest answer, and I'm gonna explain why. Uh, Evolution is ungodly. Well, that's tough. that's a tough one. That's a tough one, but uh, we'll get to it. Uh, and they don't understand why science is so obsessed with it. Why does it? What does it have to do with the price of tea in China? It has to do with everything in science. And then, last of all, the black box. How is it actually happening? Because it just doesn't. I can't look under the hood and see what's going on. I just don't understand it. So it can't be real. So what we're going to do is we're going to look under the hood. Uh, first, we're going to take care of a little problem that I had with the emotionally icky thing. Some people, a couple people, wisely contacted me and said that I misspoke, and they're right. Uh, I told a story about a woman at the State Board of Education press conference who yelled, my granddaddy was not an ape. And I said that it was ironic because I agreed with her. Um, I meant that I agreed with what she said as I believe she meant it. I assumed that she meant her granddaddy was not a chimpanzee or a gorilla. 
which not only has the element of the ick factor I talked about on New Year's Eve, but also a fundamental misunderstanding of how new species evolve. Humans did not come from gorillas or chimpanzees. So to clarify, yes, the woman's granddaddy was an ape, homo sapiens, right? But that's not what she meant, I don't think. She was implying two things. Scientists think her ancestors were gorillas, which is not correct, and gorillas can evolve to be humans. No and no, those are not gonna work. All righty, so black box, that's the one we're gonna do. How is evolution supposedly happening? Uh, first, we need to review a couple things because, you know, I'm a teacher. Why is this not advancing? Oh, there it goes. Okay, so, oops, it went really far ahead, sorry. Okay, y'all saw this on New Year's Eve, and yeah, it's a really crude graphic, but it gets the point across. The pink dot at the bottom is a, a living population, and time is going from the top to the bottom. Help! And then, uh, yeah, it's just gonna grow. The black uh, dots are the population as it becomes extinct, and then the new pink dots are the new species that are evolving. So it happens over time, and it is constant. There is no uh, starting and stopping at different species. It is, a, um, it, it is um, continuous. So, uh, yeah, somehow it's doing weird things. Sorry, folks. Okay, where are we? Oh, I'm sorry. Where are we now? Okay, analogies ahead. So uh, I'm gonna use two big analogies. One is the music, like I talked about, and another is uh, building cars. Now, please, it's an analogy. It doesn't mean it's exact, because I know what's gonna happen. Somebody's gonna call up and say, well, Beethoven was God then, right? No, 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 no. It's an analogy, it's not perfect, okay? Um, so that's where we're going with that, and um, science vocabulary and definitions. Uh, everybody know that that's a cell, right? A bunch of cells, several. And the nucleus is the brain of the cell, so to speak. And just a little bit of vocabulary, folks, just a couple things. And then the cytoplasm is the goo that surrounds the nucleus. The cytoplasm is where all the amino acids are. And the amino acids are important because those are what comprise uh, proteins. Another important thing to know is that we actually know what this stuff looks like. When I was an undergrad, atomic theory supposed all these things based on what we knew about the behavior of chemicals. And God damn it, now we have pictures of them. Yep. That, when I first saw this, I just, I did a happy dance. This is amazing. This to me is probably the equivalent of spiritual experience right here. This was amazing. Uh, so we're talking about chemicals, very small level. Uh, if you saw The Martian, he made water out of hydrogen and oxygen, chemical reaction, that's all it is. All of this is nothing but chemical reactions. The big chemical that we're gonna be talking about, the big molecule I should say, is DNA and it is comprised of four uh, nucleotides, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. Uh, that DNA codes for protein, and making protein requires assembling amino acids in a string. Okay, so here we go. The, remember that the DNA is in the nucleus and the amino acids that we need to make protein is in there in the cytoplasm. So the first step is that the DNA has to unzip, like I showed you before, and then a copy of that DNA is made. All right, how is that copy made? This is gonna seem really simplistic, but if this is too simplistic for you, you're not my target audience. All righty, so we're gonna make a bracelet and there are beads in the boxes there. And here's your string. And if you wanna make the bead proper, the bracelet properly, you have to put them on in the right order. So you go red, orange, yellow, 
green, blue, indigo, violet, right? And there you go. So here, if you look at the blue strand, which is a copy, that's basically your bracelet that you're making. And it's made in a particular order, all right? So again, we never thought we'd see these things when I was an undergrad, and here we go. This was another one of those almost spiritual moments when it comes to seeing something finally for real. Uh, we're inside the nucleus, remember, and that thing at the bottom there that says beginning, or begin, DNA, and end, that black strand going through the middle of there is the DNA. The beginning of the DNA is on the right and ends on the left, of course. And what's happening there is that they're building bracelets, basically. You start with the beginning of the DNA and they put the first bead on. And as you read across the DNA, you put more and more beads on until you have the whole bracelet made. I hope that makes sense. So if you look at this and see what's going on, when you make a bracelet from DNA, you're not just making one bracelet. You can see here that they're making hundreds from a single strand of DNA all at once. So when a chromosome opens up, the chemistry just goes to town. There's no line waiting. It's just and it happens very quickly. So here's another one of those pictures that's showing beginning to finish with a DNA in the middle, and it's just freaking brilliant. Right there is your, a bunch of copies. Those little hairs on there are copies of the DNA. So now you got a copy of the DNA, and it needs to get out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm so that we can do something about it because there's, there aren't any build of building blocks to make protein in <coughs> the nucleus. All right, so we've got our information, and the information has been given to the copy, and here in this analogy, the conductor has the information, and we're gonna go into the cytoplasm, which is the musicians and all of their experience, and we're gonna make some music, some actual music, we're gonna make some protein. Car, same thing, you've got plans for a car, you give those plans to a foreman in a, a factory, and then eventually, with lots and lots of work, with nothing more than metal and plastic, you make cars. Um, not sure what that is. All right, so the information goes out, that copy goes out into the cytoplasm, and this should look somewhat familiar, because it's kind of the same thing. That orange line shows you where the copy is. That's the beginning, that's the end. Those blobs there, those are the molecule that is the interface between the DNA copy and where the protein is built. And right there, that is a protein being built. And if you look, it's just like the um, manufacture of the copy in the nucleus. You start out with a short uh, protein and it's being built onto as you go around until you have the full length protein. And then that protein, because of the molecules that it's made up of, folds into different kind of proteins. That's why even though we're all just protein, we're all sorts of different kinds of protein. The stomach is different from the skin and so forth, and that's where that comes from. All right, so how do mutations occur? This is all background just to get to mutations. All righty. Uh, we're gonna use a little couple more terminal terms in here to make things clear. Uh, you got yellow, purple, orange, and pink. Those represent adenine, cyt cytosine, uh, guanine and thymine, basically, forgive me, biologists. And uh, to make it simpler, I'm going to give them numbers so that each uh, nucleotide has a corresponding number. Now, if you're going to read these nucleotides and code for 20 different amino acids, it's not gonna work to have one nucleotide per amino acid. It's not going to have work to have two nucleotides per amino acid. You're going to need three. So this nucleotide sequence gets read in threes, 
and those threes are called codons. And those codons match up to, the, the specific codons match up to the amino acids that they code for. Alrighty, so if you have this, the series of numbers here, I've kept it simple. These are codons, so you have a codon of ones, twos, threes, fours, etc. And then the last codon is different, and that's because it has to be to stop the process of making the protein. It's what's called a stop codon. So, you, and that'll be important in a second here. So, mutation can occur when one nucleotide gets switched out, and that means instead of 444, you have 443, you're going to get a different amino acid there. And that means that the protein's going to fold differently and you have a mutation. Another possibility is uh, that when that nucleotide gets switched out, it's switched out in such a way that it shuts down production of the protein early. If you see, the 333 got turned into 343, which is our stop codon. And so we lose the tail of that protein. Another thing is to have a codon duplicated, so you have an extra 222 in there. Um, another one is to have something dropped. We lost a 444 in there. And then there's uh, mutations where series of the, um, uh, the, the string get duplicated over and over and over again. Um, so there they all are again, if you're playing at home. And here's the, the final one. This is where I think mutations will make the most sense to people. If you insert a single uh, nucleotide in there that's extra, uh, you see how the 222 got split, and it shifts the frame of reading for every single codon all the way down. That's really going to jack up the protein. Okie dokes. And here's an example. On the upper left-hand side is normal hemoglobin. Bottom left is a sickle cell hemoglobin. It's actually twice the size that it shows there. And sickle cell anemia is a, a very serious disease. I think most people would know that. Uh, the difference between sickle cell anemia and not sickle cell anemia is a single nucleotide. One thing can change that much. Same with cystic fibrosis. Same with a uh, bunch of other diseases that I had listed, but I can't lay hands on immediately. Let me see if I can find them. Nope, don't have them. That's on my notes in the thing. So the only difference there is one amino acid, one, one amino acid switched out. All right. so. This is also important, if you look at the insect basal plan, my PhD is actually in entomology, so I'm always going to go back to bugs, sorry. Hooray! <laughs> Hooray for bugs. Uh, the insect body plan starts out with your basic segmented worm, and what that means is that you start out with a blob of, of cells and then a, uh, a, the genes get coded over and over again. They're repeated in the segments. And then you have a modification so that every segment gets a leg. And then you have modifications where those legs become other things. And it doesn't take much to disrupt that because if you change a single uh, gene, the antennae on a fly, the Drosophila, will turn, revert back to legs. So a small mutation can make a huge difference. If you look at uh, crayfish, they're delicious, and they have lots of different doodads sticking out of them. They have antennae and mandibles and the mouth parts of various sorts and the little flippers that people uh, play with at the end of them. And every single one of those doodads sticking out of a, a crawdad, every single one of them comes from the basal plan of uh, that segmented worm with lots of legs. So, really, if you take a simple tune, like a leg, so to speak, and then, I don't know if you can skip it. All right, so it's not going to work. 
but if you watch this guy's work, um, he uh, plays variations on the theme of Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, and it becomes very ornate. Uh, so if you want to learn more about what's going on here, uh, I left out lots of details. Go to YouTube. There are three search uh, things that you can put in there to find the best videos. I looked through all sorts of videos. And these three, I think, are probably the next step if this was of interest to you. And there's Beethoven's Fifth again. All righty. All right. That's it in a nutshell. Cool. Very small nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. Now you know everything there is to know about evolution. You didn't even have to go to school and get a PhD or anything. You got it all, right? <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, there's yeah, mountains yeah. of stuff. And Claire will be back for more, I'm sure. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see if we get calls at all. Probably not today, because mm -hmm. we're already lines full with other stuff. Yeah. Uh, but well, as stuff fine. comes in, we can kind of address fine. it as we go along. Yeah.